the topic of my talk is trends in data management, and then that leads to trends in data virtualization. One of the major trends that I actually don't even spell out specifically in my talk is what you've heard already from uh, Mark Beyer and Ted Hills, which is we've always done data integration by physically consolidating it using ETL. The trend now is to start to consider when that is and is not appropriate. And as that trend continues, you get to the point of uh, Ted's email signature that says, why would you ever not do something in real time? Right? Why would you ever not virtualize before you potentially have to batch or have to consolidate? And what happens is you, you reach this tipping point where you realize that batch consolidation, uh, batch processing is simply another tool to meet your SLAs. But it's not necessarily how you should design your information architectures. Right? It's just part of that tool set. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about um, some high-level uh, information uh, management trends and how they might affect you and how they are emerging to influence data virtualization. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the virtualization adoption trends that we're seeing in our customer base. And I want to talk about how we then take those and apply them to our platform strategy so that you can see how we make decisions about what features data virtualization should have. And then I'll spend a little bit of time just giving you a, a glimpse into what we see as the future of uh, data architecture and, and data virtualization. Okay? Now, I should mention that um, you know, there were two really important questions today. One is, um, why are you wearing a tie? And I'm, I'm wearing a tie because I'm a vendor. <laughs> and uh, um, the second question is, why should you listen to anything I say? I don't have an answer for that one. But every, everything that I'm going to talk to you about up until we get to the uh, data virtualization platform strategy are things that we've heard from customers of ours from potential customers of ours through conversations and from our discussions with various analysts from Forrester and Gartner to independent analysts um, like Sean and, and, and others. So most of this is an accumulation of things that we learn from our market. And um, as uh, the introduction said, we've been doing this since 2002. So we have a reasonable amount of experience that we've accumulated in, in those discussions. So, What's the state of enterprise information today? And why is this important to data virtualization? Well, the first thing is we've got more demanding business users. Uh, Mark Beyer talked about this, that no longer is it uh, OK to just let uh, the information um, be processed on, on IT's time frame. You've got impatient users saying, look, I don't care what your problem is, but I need my data, uh, and I need it now. Figure it out. You've also got younger staff who grew up with um, iPods and uh, smartphones and iPads and, and Android, and essentially they just say, give me the data, I can do it myself. So you've got a lot of self-service uh, tendencies going on there. This is, this is not something that's going to slow down at all. It's just going to increase. And so the idea here is that for the last 20 years, business users have been, to some extent, putting up with the constraints that IT tells them they're living under. And they're not going to take it anymore. So we have to figure out what's the next phase in dealing with information that will serve those business users better. Because after all, that's why we manage information. Um, <laughs> information overload. Uh, I, I had to laugh this morning when it was on Mark Byer's slide, and he said, there's no such thing, and, and he's right. <laughs> but having said that, we, we are processing more information than ever before. And, and we're, um, we're dealing this, with this in two ways. One is the, the volume of data we're dealing with is growing exponentially. Uh, the statistics that he showed, one of them that I heard as well, was that 2010 was the first year in history that information under management doubled in one year. And that, that curve, if you draw it, is uh, definitely exponential. Now, part of this is because we're producing new information. 
We've got new sensors. We've got machine-generated information. We've now got click streams from web users. We've got call logs from cell phone use. And so we're generating a lot more information. That's just a fact. But we're also exacerbating this problem because we keep copying that same information over and over and over again. Um, whether it's through replication, which you can pretty much throw away and re-replicate, so that's not necessarily information that has too much management overhead, or whether it's through physical consolidation and summarization, we keep copying that same information over and over again, which is a new copy, which adds to this uh, exponential growth. The second half of this, though, is now you've got to take this huge volume of data and turn it into information, and you don't just have to deliver it through Cognos in a report, you've got to deliver it through five different BI tools and dashboards, and you've got to deliver it to mobile users on their iPads and their, uh, their Android devices and their Kindles. Um, that's just the reality of business today. So it's, uh, it, it isn't an insurmountable problem, but it means that the old tools won't necessarily uh, meet the need. Finally, we're doing this against the backdrop of all of the stuff that we've created over the last 30 years in data management. And so we have these architectures that are uh, calcified and Byzantine and uh, essentially the spaghetti graph that we're all familiar with, where everything depends on everything else and you really cannot change anything without breaking everything. We have to get out of that problem somehow. Right? We, we can't continue to layer um, uh, and, and solve these problems without having the agility to be able to move quickly and make different decisions about the architectures that serve the business. Okay. Now, there's good and bad news in some of the new technologies that are coming along. Um, you've got a lot of new options for how to store and manage information, but that also can contribute to this complexity. So, there's, uh, there's good and bad news in here, and you need to start thinking about how to separate, separate these problems from one another. The problem of managing and delivering information from the problem of what information does the business user actually want. Okay, so because of those three overriding situations in uh, information management and data management, what trends are being produced because of that? So the first one is that the data warehouse is no longer considered the source or the target of all data integration. And what's interesting about this is uh, I, I'm guessing that nobody in this room can say you have one single centralized data warehouse that meets all of your visibility and reporting needs. And yet that has always been the stated role of the data warehouse. And there are some people who continue to cling to that dream, but it is a dream. The data warehouse plays a really important role in your business and will continue to play an important role, but it will never have all of the information that you need to get visibility into what's happening in your business and to produce the reports that your business users need. That's okay, right? But you just have to recognize that fact. And by the way, there's not one data warehouse. You probably have three. Um, or you know, at Bank of America, they have Merrill Lynch's and Bank of America's and, and four others. Right? So there is a bunch of data warehouses that you're going to have to deal with. And so you have to start thinking of the data warehouse not as the central point of data integration, but as one tool in how to manage data in a larger scheme. All of Ted Hill's presentation was on real-time data. This is just a fact. Um, inf all information needs are moving towards real-time. And I don't have to belabor this point, except to say that the businesses that are being most competitive and outpacing the market are the ones that embrace this idea. And you know this in your own life, because as you go and um, uh, order something on Amazon and they're presenting to you the, the other things you might be interested in, that's real-time information management. Or as you are um, uh, getting, uh, getting a withdrawal from your account and you get home and you've got an email that gives you some kind of warning about your account. 
Okay? That didn't happen overnight. It happened as that information changed at the enterprise. And those are the businesses that you feel as a consumer are most responsive to your needs, and it's the, those businesses that will win in the marketplace. So you have to be moving towards real-time information. One of the uh, uh, histories we have in IT is always trying to reduce vendors and reduce uh, systems and try to standardize on something that we can use for everything. Well, that's just been blown all to heck in the last five years, right? Because you've got really great fit-for-purpose data sources coming along that you can use for certain purposes that aren't necessarily going to be from a single vendor. Um, so you've got your data warehouse vendor, you might have your operational data store, you know, whether it's Oracle or SQL Server, um, but now you've, maybe you've got an Atiza box, or maybe you've got some Vertica for doing uh, some columnar analytics. And, and maybe you're dabbling with uh, some NoSQL and some MapReduce. The point here is that there is a trend towards data sources that are really good at doing certain kinds of processing. And if you take advantage of those, you're going to achieve some real benefits over just trying to use one single data source for everything. Um, of course, this leads to more silos, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but, but you get the idea. It used to be that data quality was one thing that you bought, and when your data migrated from your transactional to operational systems and from your operational systems to your warehouse, you did data quality. And that's how you achieved data quality. But that no longer works. And so what's happening is data quality is being addressed at every level in the information chain. Probably the most cost-effective way of addressing data quality is in the source. When the data is created, make sure that it is created with the integrity that it needs to be used throughout the enterprise. But there's still neat times when you want to create um, master data and uh, customer data management where you might have to do data quality when you do that kind of consolidation. But there's also times when you might need to do standardization of dates and formats and uh, enrichment as it moves to the user interface. So data quality is being addressed at all layers. The trend is to push it back as far as possible towards the source to make sure that your data is of highest quality when it's created but it's being done all along the way. So what that means is you can't really address data quality with a purchase decision. You have to address data quality as a process decision. And, and how do we actually put processes in place that ensure the quality of our data when we need it to be of that quality? Um, one of the things that um, people often ask us about data virtualization quality is, well, you really can't do data quality as the data is moving, right, through, through your system. And, and that's really not true. There's a lot of data quality that you can do as data moves. There's also data quality you don't want to do as data moves. As, for example, if you create a customer master and you need to scan all of your customers and do matching and deduping, you want to do that once and then persist it because you don't want to do it in real time. It might even require manual intervention. <coughs> Excuse me. But there's other kinds of data quality, like, gosh, this phone number is formatted incorrectly, or uh, the, the area code, uh, the, the, the zip code here needs to be enriched with the zip plus four. That stuff can be done as data flows through the system. As Ted was talking about, it's just, it's, it's milliseconds worth of processing that allows you to not necessarily have to do that in a batch process when you move the data and copy it. Okay, so there's a lot of options for doing data quality, some of which may have to be persisted, some of which can be done in real time. We've all heard a lot about cloud computing over the last um, probably year, maybe a couple years. Uh, it's happening. Um, now, most enterprises are starting to look at how they can leverage cloud computing. Some enterprises are leveraging it accidentally because they're using Salesforce.com or they're using some other cloud-based system that forces them to actually have data and processing in the cloud. But there's real focus on trying to leverage cloud-based architectures to reduce costs and increase efficiencies and agilities. And 
as enterprises start to look at how to leverage these, it has a lot of impact on the data. Um, one of the funny things about cloud computing is a lot of us have already been doing cloud computing just whenever we um, uh, have uh, any kind of outsourced IT architectures, whether it's down the street in a uh, shared environment or whether you've actually outsourced it to a third party. Um, you know, General Motors is one of our customers, and they don't even call it cloud computing, but they have a lot of data that's outsourced to various vendors. I'm sure some of you have the same situation. So cloud computing is actually a culmination of a lot of different techniques and uh, technologies coming together to produce um, efficiencies and elasticity that we couldn't achieve before. But as somebody said, there's not really ever anything new under the sun. It's just how you apply it in different ways. OK, so, so those are kind of the trends that we see in, in data management in general. Um, what trends are we seeing in our customer base as people adopt data virtualization? And this is important. You're here today because you had an interest in data virtualization to some level. And so the questions that you have are going to be, how do people get into this? And how do they start to adopt data virtualization that makes sense for your enterprise? And I can tell you that different enterprises do it differently. There are some trends that I'll talk about here. But some enterprises start very carefully. One small project, one small footprint. Let's put our toe in the water and see if this crazy new stuff really works. Other enterprises are pretty convinced it works. They've talked to a bunch of people, and they'll dive in with a whole shared architecture and um, put a center of excellence in place and go whole, whole hog. Um, neither of those are right or wrong. This is a new technology, and so you have to get comfortable with it for your own enterprise and your own temperament in your IT organization. But what I'm going to outline here are just some of the trends that we're, we've seen as we've talked to customers and seen them adopt uh, data virtualization. So the first thing is creativity. Um, we've talked about the fact that it used to be very easy. You would consolidate your data into the warehouse, and you were done. Um, now there's a much more uh, propensity towards creative mix of consolidation, change data capture, messaging, virtualization. What makes sense for the situation that I'm in here? So they're going to mix and match physical. We're going to use different flavors of caches. And we're going to try to reuse assets across different uh, uh, delivery app mechanisms to different consumers. This um, willingness to be creative is what opens the door to allow you to start to leverage some of these newer technologies. You will find resistance in um, surprising places uh, to trying this. First of all, in your own staffs. If people are used to doing consolidation and ETL, to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, why should I change? It's always worked. I'm just going to continue to consolidate and replicate data because I know it works, and I'm not going to get fired. Um, but as the business changes, we know that that's no longer sufficient. Um, so you'll find, you'll find resistance to this even in your own staff. You'll also find uh, resistance to this in um, fiefdoms that have certain invested interest in keeping things the way they are. Like, for example, data warehousing as a practice has been around for a long time. It has a very successful track record um, for about 85% you know, of the problem. And and the, the owners of data warehouses have a lot of clout and power in companies, as they should. It's a really important practice. But not all data warehouse practitioners have come to the realization that those warehouses need to be augmented and supplemented with virtualization and other real-time uh, data techniques. So you will find resistance around your organization, but w the trend we see is when people are willing to be creative about how they solve the problems, that's when they start to realize some of these benefits. How is this different from a dynamic data grid? Um, in the large, this is not very different from a dynamic data grid. And in fact, you'll see towards the end of my talk that it looks very much like a dynamic, uh, enterprise-wide, global data grid. OK, uh, we started evangelizing and selling data virtualization about um, eight, nine years ago. 
And it was all we could do to get people to adopt this on a project by project basis uh, to do some BI reporting that required data from multiple places. But that's evolved over the years. Um, I mentioned the data warehouse uh, owners. It used to be that we couldn't even talk to them about data virtualization because it was anathema to the mission of creating a data warehouse that had all the data that was necessary to do reporting. But now, that's changed a lot. Data warehouse practitioners are embracing virtualization as a way to extend warehousing and combine multiple warehouses and actually continue to gain value from this practice known as data warehousing. So, so as, as this adoption cycle starts to move, we're seeing a broader set of use, users. People are starting to reach common canonicals across their business. Um, scale is becoming much more important because instead of being a project, now we're putting a layer above the data warehouses and potentially moving to an enterprise layer where we have multiple consumers uh, accessing multiple data sources and being managed centrally. So as a result, for us as a company, and you'll see in our, our, our platform strategy, is we've had to um, move from sort of hardcore uh, technology and query optimization to also encompass things like best practices and governance and, of course, scalability and disaster recovery and, and, and redundancy and all the things that make this an enterprise-wide um, middle, uh, middleware uh, technology. Okay. The use of uh, MPP systems like Natiza and columnar systems like Vertica uh, is proliferating. Almost, I would say, two-thirds to three-quarters of our customers have one or more of these in production. And, of course, that's driving data virtualization in general, um, but it's just a reality that they want to take advantage of these. Uh, NoSQL is being tested, evaluated, uh, played with, um, but I think that there's a realization that it's so different than the processing we've been doing that although there is initial rush and an initial exuberance to use um, MapReduce and Hadoop and other NoSQL solutions, there's also a certain um, surprise there at how difficult it is to use those in conjunction with some of your traditional data processing efforts. Um, I, uh, we happen to believe there's tremendous value there in uh, these NoSQL systems and certainly in, in MapReduce as a strategy, but how you integrate that with your uh, traditional data processing is, is something that, that needs to be addressed. We've worked hard in, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, we've worked hard to try to bring those into the fold. Um, but just as a, as a trend, we don't see a ton of production uh, NoSQL instances right now. And finally, um, people are starting to feel the pain of cloud-based data being geographically separated from enterprise data. The, the typical place this shows up is when you have something like salesforce.com and you now want to do reporting uh, between salesforce.com and your internal financial system. And, of course, Salesforce wants you to put all the information into Salesforce and use their reporting. Um, how many of you want to move all your SAP data into Salesforce? <laughs> right? This is just not going to happen. Right? Um, the opposite is to take all the Salesforce data and ETL it back into your enterprise. Well, that's silly. That's why you started using the cloud in the first place, is to get it out of your enterprise. So why do you want to immediately copy it back into your enterprise? Um, this, this pattern of uh, cloud-based data being separate from the data that's inside your firewall is something that's just, um, just starting to, to show, its, uh, show its teeth, and it's going to continue to get worse. So it's something that, that you're going to have to prepare for. Okay, so... Um, so with those trends and those um, uh, realities of, inf of enterprise information management, how do we make decisions on what we build? Uh, our vision for data virtualization is to create an enterprise-wide data fabric so that you can get consistent access to all of your data whenever you need it. Okay. Now, what's underneath that 
is going to be a mix of strategies for consolidating and change data capture and, and, and um, uh, master data management and all the things underneath here about how do you manage data. But, but our vision is to have a layer here that allows business users to get all the information they need when they need it in a consistent and timely manner. And so as we evaluate product and strategies and what we should build, that's what we're looking at. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, we have five different um, uh, dimensions along which we make decisions and investments in our product. Uh, the first one is wider access. New sources are coming online all the time, varying shapes, uh, varying protocols. I mean, it was one thing when everything was relational and you could connect to it through ODBC and issue a SQL query. But then came along web services. And of course, everybody's got their favorite spreadsheet on their desk. And now we've got multi-dimensional data sources and NoSQL data sources. And so there are all kinds of different varying shapes and sizes. We have to be able to handle all of those shapes and sizes and allow you to bring that data together in a dynamic way so that you can use it effectively. Um, I, one of the uh, realities of data management is that most data sources are write only. The data goes in and you never see it again. Right? And it's just ridiculous. We're spending all kinds of money and time managing this data and we can't get it out. We can't use it effectively to make decisions. So the whole idea of our wider access is we need to be able to access all of the data in your enterprise and in your partners to allow you to access it and, and make decisions. Because we're doing this data access in real time on demand, we need to continue to focus on deeper and more intelligent optimizations for how to do that. Our whole company, some of you may or may not be aware, our company started in this bullet, which is how do you create a federated access to data that can actually run efficiently and solve this problem? And, and in investing in that early, we now have the most advanced federated optimizers in the market to solve a much wider variety of problems than could ever be solved before using virtualization. And we will continue to invest in that because that is our deep intellectual property. Now, I, I am the first to acknowledge that not every problem can be or should be solved in real time, dynamically, through federated query. I've already mentioned a couple today, like um, uh, creating your master data for your customer, or you have to do deduping and and probably some quality control in there that, that is, has manual intervention. Uh, maybe you've got some, some deep analytics that require uh, real time, uh, the time series analysis and multiple passes over the data to chew on it. You probably don't want to do that stuff using virtualization either. So there's a, a bunch of places where you may not want to use it. But where you can use it, we've made sure that it will run as fast as possible. And in doing that, we've opened up the possibility to a lot of other use cases that might not otherwise have been in the realm of data virtualization. So we will continue to focus on this as part of the reason that data virtualization is a viable technology today. As people have moved from projects to layers to global deployments, we continue to invest in making our product uh, capable of handling that kind of infrastructure. And I'll show you some pictures in a few minutes. But the idea is you can't just set up a single uh, composite server. You've, now you're going to need a cluster of composite servers. And you're probably going to need a super cluster of clusters to create this global fabric. And we have to make sure that that works, that it has management tools in place, and that can, it can scale as your business needs grow. And, and so we invest quite a bit of time and energy there, especially over the last several years. Because we're now moving to a much broader set of users, we want to continue to make these things easy to use. Um, data virtualization has always been the agile form of data integration, just like there's an agile form of programming. Right? In the old days, if any of you are software engineers, the old days you had the waterfall method of do all the requirements, design the system, build the system, test the system, deploy the system. Right? It was a straight line down the waterfall. And data integration has followed that same model. Right? But programming over the last five to 10 years has taken on an agile programming approach. Iterate and release. Right? Release often and release um, less 
each time so that you eventually converge on a goal. Uh, data integration is the same kind of thing. It's, it's an iterative approach to getting to the right solution. Uh, as a result, you usually get to a solution that solves the problem and you usually get there faster, but it's an iterative approach. And as people start to use this, it's important that the tools that they're using allow that iterative and interactive approach and are easy to use, uh, whether it's a DBA or a power business user who's putting together these data virtualization solutions. And finally, better governance. Uh, you know, governance has always been an afterthought um, until the last few years, and now it's becoming more and more important because we have these data flows that are happening in real time. We have more compliance requirements. We have more privacy requirements. And all of these um, constraints on your data means that you need to govern your data movement, your data replication, and your data uses much more closely. Now, data governance is about people, processes, and some technology. Our role in this is the technology. How do we enable you to do better governance by giving you visibility into the lineage of data, by showing you who's accessing data and how often, um, how much data is flowing from this system to this system. So we focus on capabilities to allow you to do better governance and put those governance processes in place. Okay. So I just wanted to highlight a few recent features that, that fall into that model just to give you some examples. Um, this year, we added access to Sybase IQ, Vertica, and uh, Hadoop through Hive. If you're familiar with Hadoop at all, it's a uh, programming model using MapReduce. There's a uh, component that's layered on top of that called Hive that looks sort of like a database, but not exactly like a database um, in the sense that it has an extreme subset of SQL that um, doesn't always act like you would expect SQL to, ask, to act. But we put an adapter in place that allows you to essentially access Hadoop through Hive just like you would a normal database. So it's pretty astounding when you can take um, business objects or microstrategy or Cognos and run a report that includes data out of Hadoop. That's pretty exciting. Deeper optimizations, I said we will always invest in this. Um, uh, just a couple examples here. Uh, we introduced a join strategy last year called a data ship join. And we did this through our initial partnership with Natiza. And we've now expanded it to um, Oracle and Sybase. And we'll continue to expand it to encompass all of our data sources. And the way a data ship join works is um, sometimes it's more efficient to move one set of data closer to another set of data to do the processing than it is to pull both sets of data into a central place and process it. Our optimizer recognizes when that's the case and automatically takes data from this system, extracts it, creates a temp table over in this system, and then does the processing over there. That's called a data ship join. And uh, it turns out that for uh, when you have a table with multiple billions of rows in it, it's much better to move the hundreds of thousands of rows close to the billions of rows rather than try to stream them both over the network. The question is, would this be a valid uh, would a valid use case to apply this to be where you've got 98% of your data in Natiza, but then you've got some real-time data happening outside of Natiza? Um, maybe, maybe not. I'd have to learn more about it. But that sounds more like a horizontal partitioning problem where you really want to run the query both places and, and union the results. Um, this, let me give you an example where this might make sense is I've got a um, Natiza system that's accumulating uh, click-through details or call records um, from a mobile phone and, and, and there's just a ton of it, right? There's probably billions of rows in this table. And over here I've got a customer database and I want to find out all of the um, customers, uh, I, I want to find out all of the information about how this set of customers is using our website. Maybe it's we did something different in New York and so I want to take all the New York customers and find out what their clickstream pattern looks like or what their call records look like. Well, rather than trying to do that vertically partitioned join in memory by streaming the billions of rows of uh, call detail records, if I can first serialize this by querying the customers, pulling those out and moving them over to Natiza next to the call records and then do a join in Natiza, that's going to be a lot more efficient than, than streaming them through memory. What's the break point? In other words, when does this not work? Yeah, and, and again, this is where we are the first to acknowledge that there are times 
when the questions you're asking require you to move too much data over the network in real time. And when that happens, then you want to think about an alternative strategy to actually doing pre-staging, physical consolidation. Maybe some of our caching technology can help with that. Maybe you actually have to do ETL and change data capture to keep things synchronized and up to date. All of those things are valid, those approaches. Where that breakpoint is really depends on the questions you're asking, the bandwidth of your network, the SLAs of your expected response time. Um, some people, if the report runs in an hour, they're really happy because it used to take six hours. Other people, if the report runs in a second and a half, they're really mad because they really wanted sub-second response time. So the breakpoint depends on what your constraints are. Question is, uh, we've, we've seen some uses in um, banking and retail. Um, the question is, are there also uses in uh, health systems and um, uh, real-time uh, data being processed about, uh, for example, disease spread and center for disease control type information? One of the reasons that it makes sense for all of us to be in this room is that all of these problems are similar across different information domains. And real-time information in uh, that kind of application is very similar to the real-time information in the capital markets. Um, as it's happening, you need to make decisions on what's the next place you need to move. Um, one of my favorite examples is in the energy industry. Um, uh, about well maintenance. They used to do well maintenance by relying on last night's batch integration, but that wasn't enough because a new well would fail at 10 a.m. and they want to send the crew there. Now they do it using virtualization in real time. Um, I don't have a specific one in, in uh, disease management or health right now, um, uh, but I'm thinking some of our sales. Yeah, Bob. We have a, our customer EPA has a similar Okay. So maybe, maybe you can talk to Bob Reary after this. He probably has some knowledge about that uh, EPA uh, use case. Let's see, a couple other examples. Uh, we, we do, um, I've got 10 minutes, okay. And I want to leave some time for questions. So we do caching, um, and caching is really helpful when you're, there's a gap between your SLA and your uh, uh, real-time delivery. And, and one of the things we added recently was the ability to do uh, incremental caching and distributed caching. And we added that in our most recent release. Um, and this allows you to do broader deployments globally and allows you to do larger caches. Um, we also added the ability to monitor your environment much more effectively through a, um, a nice graphical tool that shows you the system. So just a couple of slides here. If this is your, um, you've got a cluster in London and a cluster in New York and you're caching data there in A and B, and now down in that Sybase IQ system, if a piece of data changes, that data gets incrementally updated in London and then gets automatically synchronized in New York. So even though that cache could be you know, half a billion rows, if this one single data uh, value changed, it gets shuttled around very efficiently. So that's some uh, technology that we've added recently. Uh, this is, are some screenshots of the monitor. Uh, this is an example of moving into the operational environment versus just in the development and deployment environment is now we have composite clusters running in your network operations center and so we need visibility into what's going on and so the monitor is actually a really great tool that gives you that real-time visibility into how the system is operating. Uh, when this is running, you see little white balls running around the system showing you data access and queries going to the underlying systems. Okay, uh, last feature, I, I'm gonna uh, skip a couple here, but um, we have a, a technology called Discovery that allows you to actually discover relationships among different data sources. And so here we've got a couple of data sources that have internal relationships through their foreign keys. And uh, you can see that they're completely separate. But if you run our discovery tool on it, it can actually find relationships across these data sources based on the inherent data that's in there. You can then select a few of these and immediately create an integrated view across multiple data sources without having pre-knowledge of what those uh, relationships were. So it's a really cool uh, um, uh, tool to jumpstart your virtual data integration efforts. Okay, so that's, that's how our platform strategy works. Um, I just want to talk a couple of minutes here about the future, and then I'll take questions for as long as you want. I can go into lunch. Um, of course, you're probably thinking, what? I want to go eat lunch. <laughs> but so um, in the beginning, we had client server, 
And this worked really well for a few years. And then we even evolved this to web processing where the client was the app server and the thin client was the web browser. Um, and that worked pretty well. Um, and, and now, of course, people are even starting to evolve that into the cloud. Uh, the problem is that the world isn't this simple anymore. And we've been talking about that, that the world looks, your world looks more like this, where you have uh, data warehouses and analytic stores, and you've got some data in the cloud, and maybe you've got some um, spreadsheets that you want to process. And of course, you've got some web services that your partner's offering to you. And some of these things are in the cloud, and some of them are on premises. And so how do you deliver data to those consumers in a way that makes sense without tightly coupling and binding up your whole IT architecture. Well, that's where we come in. And so we, we sit above that and we, we, we rationalize all of that complexity to allow your consumers to be decoupled. And as you extend this to uh, a larger deployment across the globe, you end up with clusters and super clusters of composite servers with consistent metadata and a consistent representation for not only the users that are sitting at desks, but the users that are walking around with their mobile devices. And so that's, when we talk about a global data fabric, that's what we're talking about. You know, we're not gonna provide the elastic storage, but the cloud providers certainly are. But the comprehensive access, loose coupling so that you no longer have to uh, change everything when you change one thing. Semantic abstraction so that you don't have to have the physical data look like the data you deliver to the consumer. Right? These can be separate things. In fact, we can detangle these problems. Location independence so that if I'm in London, I can get data whether it's in New York or Singapore. Right? It doesn't matter. I don't need to know as a consumer. The data fabric knows where the data is and how to get it you get to leverage all these fit-for-purpose data sources so that you can take advantage of this really cool technology, whether it's the columnar sources or the map reduce sources. You want to be able to use that stuff, but if you don't have an abstraction layer in place to insulate your applications from it, it's, it's just going to contribute to the mess we already have. You're going to want to partition data between archive and current, you're gonna to wanna to partition data between geographies, you're gonna to wanna to partition data by businesses. All of those data partitions are great processing strategies, but they make it very difficult to get a complete picture unless you have a layer in place that brings it all together in real time. This is probably my favorite one. We've been solving two problems with one uh, technology for about 15 years, and that is we've been consolidating data into a central place to do two things. One, the business needs a certain set of data. What is that set of data? Well, they told you what it is. We need this data set and because we want to answer these questions. Great. The second problem is, gosh, how do I deliver that data in a way that's efficient and consistent and timely and basically all the IT concerns, right? Those are two different sets of problems, but we've been, we've been addressing both of those problems with ETL and data warehousing. And as a result, they're completely entangled and, and inseparable. If we can separate these two problems so that the business user gets exactly the data they want in a timely manner, and IT gets to make decisions about how to deliver that effectively as separate problems, you get agility. And that's really what data virtualization is about is achieving agility when you're trying to deliver data to the people who need it. Okay. So I'll take questions for as long as you'd like. Um, yes, uh, flavors of caches. Um, and, and currently we deal with a single flavor, but I wanted to highlight the fact that there's multiple flavors out there. Um, our caching is what you might think of as a materialized view. And so it's a, a, a data set that is pre-computed. Pre um, another form of cache that people are using are object caches that sit behind their app server to serve their, um, uh, the application with objects in memory. Okay? So it's about memory processing. Um, and then a, 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 a related form of that is a distributed form of that, where you've got caching across multiple um, servers and the, the object cache is actually distributed. So when I talk about different flavors of cache, that's what I mean. Okay. Yeah, I, had to, I couldn't talk about everything. So what, 
as more and more people use composite as a layer for all of their data processing, what we're starting to realize is that some of the queries that are coming to composite aren't federated, right? Which was the original reason that a lot of people used um, uh, data virtualization. Rather, they're single source and, and they're just taking advantage of this abstraction and decoupling and a lot of the other advantages. So as we started to look at that, we said, you know, we can probably optimize our server for when we recognize that this is just a single source query, we can skip certain things. And so we put in, we, we did a lot of examination of that pipeline, um, that whole processing pipeline, and we're able to not do certain things or do them more efficiently when we're just going to a single source. Because we, we have very advanced optimizers that do all kinds of query planning and plan rewriting and plan evaluation. Well, if all we're gonna do is take your query and pass it through and push it down to the underlying data source, there's a lot of that stuff that can be more efficient. Yeah, uh, question is, where is it determined whether that query that we want to run on the source system is going to hamper that system or not? Um, I'll give it to you straight. We always try to push as much work as possible down to that underlying system. So, so not only do we not make the decision, we don't want to make the decision. Uh, we believe that um, the best place to reduce and process data is as close to that system where it's stored as possible. And so we try to push as much work as possible down to that underlying system, unless it's cached, which is a separate situation. So as we do that, that's the question that um, Ted Hills answered about, you know, how do you evaluate what impact adding virtualization is going to have to these underlying systems? And it's a, it's a very good question. Each customer has to deal with it in their own way. But what all of our customers have come to realize is that it's still more cost effective for them to beef up those underlying systems to handle the virtual queries than it was to replicate and consolidate. Okay? Now, replication is still a valid strategy for handling that load. But the point is that, yes, there will be additional load on these underlying systems when you're doing real-time queries. But it's a very different profile than the ETL load. Right? We're, we're trying to pick out the 10 rows versus pull out the million rows. And we're trying to, to um, uh, be as efficient as possible at how much data gets pulled out of these systems. But there will be processing that you have to figure out how to handle. <laughs>